The UN and the world's key financial institutions say Palestine's strong enough to function as an independent state. President Abbas is due to request full UN membership at the General Assembly later this week, even though the threat of an American veto still hangs in the air. Marty's Marina Port Nair explains the UN players' positions. If global politics were a sport, the United Nations would be the grand arena. And September would be opening season. Nearly 200 of the world's most powerful and not so powerful players descend on New York City, gathering in one room for a week's worth of speeches and a chance to grandstand on the international stage. Nearly 10,000 delegates and 2,000 journalists are in town for the General Assembly debate. But in reality, five countries are the ones who really matter. Russia, China, France, the U.S., and Britain. The Permanent Security Council members with veto power. The real power in the United Nations resides in the Security Council and it requires a consensus among the five permanent members and as long as the one, one, or, one or more of the permanent members won't go along with something, the UN's ability to act is limited. No resolutions can succeed if opposed by any of the big five. Case in point, the current Palestinian campaign for UN membership and statehood, an initiative the U.S. publicly supported last year. When we come back here next year, we can have an agreement that will lead to a new member of the United Nations, an independent, sovereign state of Palestine living in peace with Israel. But this year, it's the opposite, with Washington saying it will veto the Palestinian UN membership bid, warning of additional collateral damage. One of the things that I, that I hope the Palestinian leadership is con considering is the day after. What will happen when after whatever show we have in the United Nations is done, um, what will change in the real world for the Palestinian people? The answer is nothing, sadly. Ironically, the majority of the General Assembly supports Palestinian UN membership. The Assembly alone, with two-thirds majority, can award non-member observer status to the Palestinians, like the Vatican enjoys, and doesn't need Security Council approval to do so. So no one can veto this decision. Some believe, however, the UN is the wrong forum for resolving major international disputes. It's a very dysfunctional situation, and actually the UN really isn't the one, isn't really the venue even for this. The UN only gets the sort of hype aspects of these fights and, and deals with them pretty badly too. The Israeli-Palestinian problem at the UN is, is mostly theater and this is just one, one particularly freakish example of it. This global gathering attracts the security, crowds, and media madness of a sports championship. But when it comes to practical outcomes, scoring more than a symbolic victory could be unlikely. Even if there is a permanent member or two or three who believe that uh, Palestine should not be a member of the UN, they want it on record that the vast majority of the people of the world do believe that it's time. The annual UNGA gathering always delivers headlines, highlights, bells, and whistles. Yet many wonder if this Super Bowl of diplomatic strategy leads to anything more than the event itself. Marina Portnaya, RT, New York. Well, ever since the Arab world erupted, there's been curiosity over why the America's support of rebel movements there differ from its treatment of Palestinians. For some, that's down to its influential Israeli lobby and its power to steer Washington's moves on Middle East negotiators, as Artie hears later. It is ironic, this double standard, that uh, they look at the Arab Spring as, as a way of vindication of the drive towards democracy and freedom and human rights and human dignity, and yet when it comes to the Palestinians, we are decontextualized, we are removed. This is very selective, precisely because, I think, our occupier is Israel, and Israel is a domestic issue in the U.S., and has enormous influence on the careers of, and, and the, the fates of many politicians. The U.S. in many ways has changed its policy to accommodate this most extreme government in Israel. Not only that, but it was trying to put pressure on the quartet to accept this position, uh, on the U.N. to self-negate by saying Palestinians shouldn't go to the U.N. 
on the EU by asking them to change their long-standing policy on the two-state solution. And of course on Russia, that has taken a very clear stance on the basis of international law and Palestinian rights, including the right to self-determination. So by adopting the Israeli position and then trying to shove it down the throat of the uh, quartet, uh, the U.S. is, is really distorting a, a legal system as well as a political system as well as the human imperative of achieving a just peace.